Hello there again, it's Tim, Golf 5 Tango Mike, and today I'm going to have a look at how I, and maybe you, could operate HF Portable. joining me again and if you're new to the channel then think about subscribing and pressing that notification button that bell button to tell you of any future videos so then when I operate portable I usually use two methods to operate portable both using the car as the shack first way I do it is to use a drive on uh, plate where you basically stick a fiberglass pole in and raise the antenna up and that basically supports the the antenna usually a wire antenna and the other way is to get uh, the same sort of fiberglass pole and uh, strap it, bungee it, uh, nice and tightly to a very secure fence pole. Okay, so the uh, pole of choice that I use for fiberglass pole is a spider beam pole, which is 12 metres high, okay, approximately 40 feet just under, not very light, so carrying one of these up a hill isn't really an option for you in your backpack. I use one of these strapped to a, uh, a fence post and I'll show you in a minute which antenna I use with that. Other ones you can use tend to be around 10 metres or just under in, in height. The publish has been 10 metres but they tend to be around 9.5, 9.6 metres long. Uh, they come from a variety of sources. They tend to cost quite a bit less than the spider beam but they're perfectly good enough to use. Obviously if you're going to go vertical with one of those as an antenna you can only go up about 33 feet. But they're great supports. If you're going to use such antennas as a centre for a dipole, for example, you probably are going to be doing an inverted V dipole out in the field. Be careful not to try and put up the, the feed point too high, especially if you're using maybe a small ballon, which will add, in, add in, you know, increased weight. You're probably looking at putting it around uh, the 7 or 8 metre height at the very highest, because obviously the, the, the higher you go up with one of these uh, fibreglass poles, the thinner they become more whippy they become and the less likely you're going to be able to actually uh, cope with the increased uh, sort of weight of them as well but that these spider beam poles are really really good um, you'll find them in most stockists okay uh, they're thicker they're heavier they're more durable um, but obviously they're a lot heavier now some guys who operate portable who don't go up a hill lazily in a car like me who actually get up somewhere really rough and probably a lot higher We'll probably use maybe a seven meter pole so again you know the dipole height would be less with one of those uh, but obviously you can still run up a little vertical up them as well and uh, or maybe an inverted L is loads of ways you can operate these uh, these poles they're very durable but those seven meter poles are even lighter they're probably half as light as 10 meter poles so they're really good to use as well so so remember you're looking at fiber glass poles not carbon fiber because carbon fiber runs the risk of detuning any wire antenna strapped to that pole. Because fiberglass is non-conductive, you can put up any wire antenna strapped to the pole. Absolutely no problems at all. So then, what antennas do I use portable? Well, I tend to go down the end-fed half-wave route when portable. I find those antennas very quick and easy to deploy and give you great results. And I really love them. Plus you've got the multi-band capability in them as well. No tuner, coax to your rig, bang you're on the air i'll put a little video up here of me using the high-end fed antenna that uh, I've, I've used several times before portable which ran right up the spider beam pole i've just put back over there now as a vertical and that gave me 40 20 and 10 did fantastically well uh, this is the actual uh, wire antenna itself for that high-end fed it's about 11.8 um, meters long hence if it's up to 12 meter pole and it's fed near the bottom and the actual transformer look is this so you see how small it is okay 100 watt rated great little antenna this and um, I can't I cannot recommend it enough okay and that comes just about I squeeze it in into this nice little bag here as well as they give anyway stuff for the advert for them but I'll, 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 I'll pop the link up there and I'll put another link for it in on the details as well for you underneath the video in case you want to watch that later and see how I deployed that and all I did with that as you as you've probably seen now is to strap the spider beam pole to a fence post ran it up call back to the uh, to the radio simples uh, talk about NFED half waves another NFED half wave I use as well again just reaching forward here is a full-size 66 foot version which is a half wave on 40 and also gives me um, 20 15 and 10 meters 
and uh, you can buy these quite easily commercial. I think the high-end Fedmaker version of these anyway, using the same little transformer. Um, but I use one of these as an inverted V. Get the highest point up as high as you can. If I use the spider beam pole, I probably use the 10, well I have used the 10 meter point. So you can get some good height on one of these, you know. A good antenna on 20 meters. Uh, it operates as, as a full wave on 20, you know, does a really good job. And also on 40, it's a great antenna. I've already operated it on 15 and 10 because the band's never been opened when I've been out with it. Um, and I use like 49 to 1. This is a generic one made by Hamtenna. Um, I just bought this as a 49 to 1 from him and it's done a really good job. I've used it at home several times. Um, so there you go. That's what I do. I uh, find another fence post that's available or maybe that I got a drive on plate. I maybe put like a, a three foot high section of fiberglass pole, a spare one from an old one. I attach this to that via the zip tie. You know, it's about the right, the right sort of uh, width for it. And that gets attached to it. The wire goes up then, inverted V, coax at the bottom, drop down. So either either way, they are two really uh, easy to deploy ways. There's other, other antennas you can use which do just as well. Uh, verticals will work, quarter wave verticals, all do a great job. But for me personally, because of the speed of deployment and the results I get, frankly, I, I really like using the NFED halfway. Now, the other aspect, of course, is power. This is alright having a radio up there and a nice antenna. If you can't use the things, you haven't got any juice going to it. Um, now, I don't use the battery in my car. I don't have my, my rig permanently set up in my, in my car because I, I don't want to really. Um, so I'm quite happy just to transport little FT891 from Yezu, which is my portable rig of choice these days, and that does a great job. I just carry it in and, in and out of the house, no problems at all. Now, but in terms of power then, well, here it is, nice and light, tracer battery, 22 amp power, LifePo4 battery, okay. I have to say, I've had this for four years, and I came back into the hobby. 22 amp hour, you think that's not much, but this on 100 watts, with me calling CQ, I've run a net in the past with one of these, um, four or five hours no problem at all. You think, well how can that be on 22 amp hours if we're drawing 100, you know, 100 watts? But the beauty of LifePo 4 technology, uh, LifePo 4 technology, get my words out, is that um, unlike a lead acid battery, where you see a general degradation of, of voltage output to the point where your radio becomes unus uh, unusable, with LiPo 4s, the voltage settles down, uh, for the settles down around 12.7, 12.8 with one of these, and just keeps going at the same level until eventually it finishes, right? It, it just stops. It can't give any more, but, it's, but it doesn't go down and down. So unlike a situation where you have sometimes when you're using a lead acid battery, where you um, have issues with your ability to use SSB because it's not you know you're not it's not giving you enough draw and then therefore you have issues with your modulation and your audio sounds absolutely terrible and eventually it doesn't do the radio any good either uh, because the, the, the voltage output goes down less and less with one of these it's a bit like digital TV you know with digital TV when you lose your picture you lose your picture there's no ghosting there's no snow on the picture it just goes doesn't it it's like the LifePo 4 it, it operates at exactly the same excellent level until it goes I've never drained this battery to that point. There is a fuel gauge on it as well. I mean, I take very great care about that, not to do that. And it's, it's hardly for four years. I've used it at least, I would say, 30 to 40 times a year. It charges very, very easily with a, with a, with a charging uh, thing, the charging thing, <laughs> charging brick that plugs into the, to the mains. Like you charge your, your shaver, <laughs> no, don't do that much. Or you <laughs> charge your laptop, for example, same sort of thing. Very easy way to do it. Not cheap. There's always a catch. I'll leave you to have a look at how much the price is after one of these. They're not cheap, but you get what you pay for. And my goodness, this hasn't missed a beat. And if I had to get another one tomorrow and I had the money for it, I would without even batting an eyelid. No problems at all. Now, there is not another option that I use. No, it's not, not a LifePo 4. And this is going to take me a bit of an effort. So hang on. Uh... I use a pair of these. Oh, yeah, Uasa, Uasa. I don't know how you pronounce it. 36 amp hour. Ah, and uh, yeah, these are lovely batteries. They really are. Now these are SLA. I think they're SLA batteries. Um, 
not quite the same as your well, just having a hernia not quite the same as your sort of normal old-fashioned lead acid batteries but quite similar um, I use two of them in parallel so what I do if I let me lift it up again oh I've connected a uh, obviously negative and positive wire to a power pole uh, connection connector okay so what I do I like power poles you might notice I had one as well with the, with the tracer so I connect the red to red black to black with another one of these identical ones and that then basically because they connected in parallel gives you not 36 but 72 amp hours okay again obviously at just over 12 volts gives you about 12 by the way with these you know when they're fully charged we should get about 12.7, 12.8, maybe 12.9, and then they gradually go down. And the trick with these batteries, as well as lead acids, is never ever to let the voltage go down below, much below 12.1 volts. That's my view, maybe 12 at the, at the, at the real outset. Once you get down to about 12.1, 12 volts, I think you've used something like about 50% of capacity. You don't want to go down any further with lead acid or SLA batteries. You don't want to do that. You want to keep um, the capacity at no less than 50% okay things will work but once you go down below 12 volts and you start to go to over 50 percent of capacity use you will start to really affect the battery and it will, will shorten its life so in order for me to check that actually before i go done to go down that route when i got them in parallel what i then do is connect one of these to the positive on one of the batteries one of these to the negative on the other battery and you've guessed that a power pole connector then which then gets connected to the the radio's uh, DC cable all right so that's how I do that and by doing it that way you are doing your best to try and draw an equal amount from both batteries now to monitor uh, the voltage on this um, I use a very very cheap and simple voltmeter which costs about 10 10 pounds 10 bucks um, not gonna be massively accurate but it'll, it'll do, be good enough and you'll see I just glance at this every so often, so I've seen myself going up from 12.8 to 12.9 and then it rested, once it rested 12.6 and after a couple of hours it might be resting at 12.4 and I know once I get below 12.3 I've got to start to think about either, start to think about when I'm going to go, go to close down or when maybe I'm then going to swap it over for this bad boy here. So there you are, that's how I operate with that. So power is very important. Um, there's different ways of doing it. People use leisure batteries. People, of course, will use the uh, will use this maybe a split charge system and have another battery in the car, which is wired in to be charged. I think by the alternator of the car. I'm not quite sure how it works, um, but you can do it that way as well if you want to. And you'd have a permanent setup then, a permanent sort of uh, lead coming from that battery in in through the, uh, the the system into the car, and then you can maybe you know you can power your rig like that. So there's different ways of doing it, but that's my preferred way anyway, and that works for me. Now another hint and tip for you is obviously when you're running a wire up a pole or actually in real real life what you'd be doing is attaching probably the wire to the top of the pole and then, then attaching it at different places until it gets to the bottom because you'll be stop, you're starting up at the top of the pole so if you strap the pole to a fence post you'll obviously have the, the top section of it already up so you'll start attaching the wire maybe to the top or to the point where you want to feed it to anyway if it's a dipole and then you know you've got to make sure that you're able to attach it very very securely but if you're running it as a vertical you've got the wire coming all the way down the pole um, it's probably best not to avoid Right, it's best to avoid having strained the top. So you don't want to have the wire being attached to the top and sort of dangling down free free fold all the way down to the bottom because if that moves, the flimsy bit at the top might well move a bit like that and cause the pole to collapse. So what you want to do is, is to attach the wire securely and safely at different points down the pole. Now what I use, or what sorry, what you can use of course is uh, insulation tape. It's good, but the pros and cons are this. Picture this, it's a December evening, you're out on the hill or wherever you are and it's getting getting dark. It's, it's been dark for a while maybe and it's starting to rain heavily. It's maybe going down towards minus figures, maybe two degrees, something like that. And you've got to get out of the car and you've got to go then and take the wire down off the pole. Now the last thing you want to do with freezing cold fingers is try to unpick that tape and get the, get the scissors under it and, and click, click, you know, and, um, get that tape off the, off the pole so my um, suggestion what I use is reusable velcro cable ties zip ties so with these um, basically they have a little loop there you put it through like that 
pull it through. That will secure the, uh, the, the antenna, the wire to the pole. There you are. Simple. So what I do when I go out, I carry a box of these out with me. Okay, and the other things I carry with me as well, just in case I need them. These are my sort of uh, things I might need. I take a couple of screwdrivers with me. Take a pair of scissors. A couple of spare adapters, barrel connectors. A bit of insulation tape. And I take a spare uh, chop block. I've got what this is ready made chop block and power pull. Keep it in an old ice cream tub. What I also take with me, you may have spotted this already, spare batteries. And what do you need batteries for? Well, of course, if it's dark, you're going to need light. So, what I use is a head torch. Now, I stumbled across in a shop called Poundland in the UK, which a lot of you guys will know. And by the term Poundland, you can probably spot by now that most things in there cost a pound, a buck. They had loads of these on sale, so I, <laughs> I went in there and basically bought ten head torches. This is one of these, by the way, this is a bit of a nicer one. And they work really well, except, the, and unlike on this one, the strap's really flimsy, so the strap always, always broke. So I'm going to ask someone in the household who's much better at sewing than me to perhaps, if she wouldn't mind, maybe one evening, maybe in the future, to uh, sew those back together because for a pound you couldn't go wrong. And I've got about 10 of them lying around somewhere and about five of them now have had the same fault with the strap going. Now this is one from a place called Mountain Warehouse which is a bit more of a dedicated sort of uh, place or shop for people who like sort of camping and hiking. And these are great. So this is char rechargeable via USB. But I take uh, batteries anyway in case I'm using one of the old ones. And uh, very useful to have those in place too. Okay, and the only other thing you need to take then really is a pad. So I tend to use, now a lot of people, they drop like special sheets for logging. I don't, I just use an old, ex I use an exercise book. Now, why an exercise book? Well, the pages can't be detached easily. And I have a little system in place there. Okay, I'll just make a record, put a date on it, draw a little line when I go to the new date, and I keep it a record. And then I do a light tick across the page once I've done I've put all those onto onto QRZ and I come back and I've got like you know weeks and weeks of stuff in here maybe months and months of stuff so I, I bought maybe five or six of those which I use and I also keep a supply of very cheap pens in the glove compartment as well in the glove box of the car and um, oh yeah and coffee <laughs> you need to have a nice big flask of coffee especially in the winter months and some of you I know one or two of you watching this will probably know I enjoy my food as well you wouldn't think of it, would you? So I tend to take uh, <laughs> a few provisions up at the hill as well for me or by the sea, wherever I'm operating. So that's basically it, really. There's not a lot, lot of rocket science to it. Um, I think the biggest trick you can learn from this is using those Velcro ties because they're reusable. And of course, what you do, what I do, is put that little... Um, actually, don't use this actual box. I use like a little... Um, it's actually a round, clear thing with a zip going right round, which actually had the bungee straps in them and I bought them. But I use that now to put the, the Velcro straps in and I weigh them down underneath one of the, the windscreen wipers when I'm operating with, with the zip completely closed so it don't get wet. And then when I then take the uh, the, um, the the antenna down afterwards then I've got the Velcro straps and I can just put them in my pocket, scrunch them up and pull them in there and off you go. So uh, yeah, that's another way of doing it isn't it? Anyway, hope that's been of use to you. If you're new to, uh, to operating HF portable or indeed to you know VHF portable, whatever, hope that's helped you a little bit. As I said, I've put hopefully earlier in the video, or do, certainly in the, in the details below, I'll do it as well, a link to that high-end fed video, just showing you how I set that stand up on a particular occasion, which is basically using the antenna I showed you earlier and the spider beam pole I've got over there. So hopefully you've uh, found out of interest. Good luck with operating portable too, especially if you haven't done it for the first time, or if you haven't done it for a long time since lockdown. I can't wait to go back up somewhere and do it myself properly now over the next few weeks. Take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click subscribe and uh, that notification bell as well. It'd be good to have you on board. This is G5TM wishing you all the best. Stay safe and 73 now. Bye-bye.